Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take this moment to say thank you for listening to the Real Rescue Podcast. It means a lot to me that you enjoy these stories as much as I do. Since the start of this podcast, we've had a lot of support from all over the world. It has been amazing. Now, we have companies joining our team that also want to say thank you for all that you are doing out there standing the watch. These companies are offering discounts on their products as a way to support the rescue community and those tuning into the Real Rescue Podcast. Just go to therealrescue.com, click on sponsors, and see these incredible offers for yourself. This episode of the Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Axness, because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, Clear communication is of the utmost importance. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And Airwave, the Airwave Performance Mouthpiece, helping you to use breathing to your advantage. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. The Axness PNG Wireless ICS System can bring cutting edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere at any time on any aircraft. Plus with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircrafts worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axness.com. That's A X. NES.com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, long line, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With a certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, They are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, REALRESCUE, R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. Plus, they are offering another 10% from their partners, Petzl, and their equipment, All you gotta do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Mention this podcast and they'll take care of the rest. And Airwave. What if I told you that you could train harder for longer and recover faster just by wearing a mouthpiece? I know, I questioned it too. Then I gave it a try. The Airwave Performance Mouthpiece is a breakthrough in performance technology that is scientifically proven with over 15 years of peer-reviewed published research at the Citadel to open your airway by 25% for improved breathing, resulting in a 20% decrease in respiratory rate, an increase in muscular endurance, and 50% reduction in cortisol levels post-workout. Now, what does this mean to me? Well, now I'm able to train harder, recover faster, and be even more prepared for when that SAR alarm goes off. You don't need to take my word for it. Try it yourself and see how you can use your breathing to your advantage. Go to airwave.com or visit them on Instagram at airwave to learn more about it. Then, when you're ready to give it a try, 
Because you heard about it here at The Real Rescue, you get 10% off with the promotion code REALRESCUE, R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. Coming up next in this episode of The Real Rescue, we are joined by another one of our Finned brothers. He comes to us with more epic stories from the U.S. Coast Guard and what they do on a daily basis around the country. It's freaking mind-blowing. I absolutely love these stories. To make this even better, it's just his personality and the way he is. He did the whole thing in his truck as he's sitting out in the parking lot. I freaking love it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, United States Coast Guard, rescue swimmer number 489, Mr. Gabe Sage. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. I, I have a bad about, mouth. I don't care. I'm around kids all freaking day. So when I have a chance, I just, I'm able to just, yeah. Let it run. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't no, touch around I, the kids, so. I don't, I don't care. The, the main reason I don't care is this is your, this is your, your podcast. Like I'm just the right. host, dude. I just hold it so you can tell your stories. That's it. Oh, uh, you are way more than a host, man. You are the freaking, you're like the, the, the whole thing that's overseeing everything, man. You're the guide. The guy, I like the guide of the guys. Yes, you're the guy. You're your taking story. all of us. You are taking all of us through this freaking journey, man. Somebody has to guide us. Otherwise, we'd be freaking lost walking around forever. That's why it's so fun for me, dude. It's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let's do this. Let's do this, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Real Rescue. I have got another Finn brother with me, and actually, what makes this even more fun is that. You and I actually were in A school together, not in the same class. You were two classes in front of me. And at one point, I specifically remember your class whooping the shit out of our class. Just saying. Our baby class, man. Our baby class. I loved it. Yeah, thanks. All right. There's love there. There's total <laughs> love, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, United States Coast Guard, rescue swimmer number 489, Mr. Gabe Sage. What's up, brother? How you doing, man? Dude, I'm fucking stoked you're here. Oh, sorry. I, <laughs> I dropped that early. I am no, not I, excited. I, I'm glad you did. We can get it started the right way. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I'm, I'm all right with that. Children, be advised. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Gabe, it is so good to see you, man. Uh, you know, you and I have been chatting for a little bit now just before we hit start. And it, like I said, dude, it's uh, it's so good to see you. Um, we were never stationed together, but other than our our, like, a school love and hate relationship <laughs> as we yes, would go yeah. into the barracks and see our rooms thrashed and telling stories <laughs> and watching you guys come out of the pool one day or, or a day and you were like what happened to you and you're like i can't talk about it it was terribly nope. awesome <laughs> <laughs> but actually uh, one of my one of my favorite moments at a school was with your classmate tony puglia Love the guy. And the day that we finished our final multi and we were, we were getting ready to go to Thanksgiving break. So it was like a Wednesday afternoon and we we're doing like an all hands and we're sitting in that room waiting for them to come in and give us the meeting. I look back at Tony and I go, I'm a fucking swimmer, bitch. And the look on his face was just like, cause you, I think he just went, you guys just went through a massive beat down. I'm sure in class that day. And the look on his face was just like, just, he hated me so much at that moment, but I was, just, I was on top of the world, man. That feeling, you remember that feeling, that last oh, yeah. time, that, that final multi, and you know you're there. So yeah, You're done. You're like, I did it. Oh, yeah. I did it. <laughs> you and Tony were in Hawaii together for a little while, right? Yeah. So Tony and I were um, stationed in Hawaii for our whole time together there. And then right we were never stationed together again, but like our careers kind of followed each other for quite a bit, like, you know, northwest and yeah down to the gulf area stuff like that so <laughs> so funny dude oh uh, yeah you guys had a, a pretty large class too well i say that four or five guys right five guys graduated we graduated five. we graduated five yeah yeah so that was pretty big at the time i mean most classes were not graduated but two three 
maybe Correct. four. So Correct. your we, class. We started with six. We, so we only lost one person. So and we that did was, pretty good. That was us. We actually started with eight and we graduated seven. So it was like a, we had two abnormally large classes that graduated from summer school. Was, well, and we were also, a lot of us were start of the new, when the, the um, airman program started kicking in. So I think that extra training or training prior, that's when it first kind of kicked in. So a lot yeah, of people were showing up trained somewhat at least and that was like before the maybe the heavy heavy training was done beforehand when they kind of had to throttle back but yeah. we were already given some insight which i think helped a lot yeah no you're right yeah very much so because and we were pt like you were, you were out running doing push-ups they actually worked on whatever the weakness was and you're like oh you can't do pull-ups yeah you're gonna bang out a thousand today just to work on it correct like, what yep <laughs> but yep. you know what it worked it was great so Right on. Just uh, back down memory lane with you, man. I freaking love it. <laughs> All right. So Gabe, I'll tell you what, if you don't mind, bring us back a little bit with you. What's a backstory? How did you join the Coast Guard? What brought you to being a rescue swimmer? All right. So I, I grew up in Santa Cruz, California. And so I did a lot of surfing out there. And in the Monterey Bay, you would see the 65 fly by sometimes. And then I would see like maybe a small boat. So I at least knew that the Coast Guard existed, didn't know what it was, but I knew that the Coast Guard existed. Um, we had a, there's a big earthquake in 89 and my whole family had to relocate up into the Northwest up in Oregon. And that's where I was living and finished high school and was just kind of fumbling around trying to figure out what I was gonna do. And, um, you know, I was trying to go to college, trying to try to find my life, but no no luck of anything and i was watching the news one night actually and they were actually doing this cliff rescue so it was, it was asked air station astoria at the time i was watching the news and they're pulling somebody off a cliff and i looked at the rescue on the on the tv and i go shit that's that's where i surf over there in oregon it's like a spot and i'm like that's pretty close to where i surf it's a mountain called nia Kani mountain and so it was in the back of my mind and you know longer story to them what brought me to this point but i just one day just said fuck it i'm just gonna go join because i need to do something with my life and i was that guy that said i'm gonna go join but I'm just, i want to go jump out of helicopters so obviously you know i was uh, <laughs> that typical that walked in the recruiting office and the recruiters looked at me he's like man, sure whatever sign here man good luck with that kind of thing <laughs> um so yeah I, I joined for that purpose because i just wanted to go jump out of helicopters but i honestly and real honestly i had no clue the coast guard had ships so I was that guy that literally went to boot camp and looked at these ships. And I'm going like, what the fuck is this? So I remember getting a tour <laughs> going, I didn't know these kind of things existed because all I saw was helicopters and small boats. You oh, know, I did no funny. research. Um, I just knew I wanted to jump out of helicopters. You know, I, I grew up lifeguarding. So it was just, I felt like, and I'm surfing. So I felt like it was just something that I was meant to do. Um, so, you know, I'm going to, I joined for that reason, but I want to, if you don't mind, I want to kind of fast forward real quick. Bro, um, so I, I stayed, so I joined, I got stationed in Hawaii um, on a, on a cutter actually. So I got put on one of the boats and then that's when they implemented the airman program and shifted from the ASM to AST rating. And at that time you went back to the air station that you trained at, which was Barber's point for me. So I was lucky to go back to Hawaii. So nice. my first seven years in the coast guard was actually in Hawaii. Um, I ended up getting stationed in Wait, Astoria. Real, real quick. Was that really rough? Like seven years in Hawaii, but that rough for you. <laughs> Look, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I never, I never tell anybody my my full career because honestly, I had every pick that I wanted, except for my final pick. <laughs> I had literally everything I wanted as I jump as I as I transferred, except for my last one. So I'm and my last one was Florida. So I mean, I have no right to complain, and I never will. So oh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, first seven years but in yeah, Hawaii. So I ended up <laughs> yeah, I ended up getting stationed in Astoria, you know, after my first tour. And I remember going through the logs and the books. It was like, you know, after about a year of being there. Or so and I was going through the logs and books trying to find that rescue why I joined. So they had like a they actually had like a re recording of all the rescues um, logged in a book and I was going through it. And it turns out that that rescue was actually like up in Washington. So it wasn't even the mountain that I thought it was. But three weeks later. I literally rescued a kid off Nia Connie mountain. Oh, no like, way. this kid got stuck on the cliff. And I remember the call and I remember getting out there and it was like, almost like surreal. Cause I'm like looking at this whole scene going, 
fuck? I watched this on TV. And I go, holy shit, I'm doing the fucking rescue that I thought I joined for. So it was like such That's a weird awesome. turn, right? And this rescue was 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 super wicked to do because it was a 2,000 foot cliff. So you know, like typically we want the helicopter to go over the cliff so it creates that positive contact. Yeah. But they couldn't. So they had to get the blades of the helicopters close to the cliff um, as they could. And they had to swing me into the cliff to get to the kid. Oh, and so it was God, like, so just a, like, and I remember sitting there swinging behind, under the helicopter, looking down, I'm like a thousand feet up. There's a thousand feet of cliff above me. And I'm looking down going, this is why I fucking joined. I saw this on the TV, but it was just me. It was so weird. I don't, I know. I, I had a lot of weird circumstances in my Coast Guard career that just kind of kept turning back around. So yeah. I joined and I ended up doing my own rescue. So it was kind of cool. Oh my God, dude. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? And it turned out the kid was just high as shit. He like took some mushrooms and thought he could climb the cliff and came down from his high and got scared and called for help. So don't do drugs, right? <laughs> Kids, don't do drugs. Don't do drugs. It's not yeah. worth it. <laughs> we wouldn't oh have a job if it wasn't for the stupid people though, man. So <laughs> Amen. I can't I can't remember exactly how it goes. It's uh not natural, yeah, saving natural selection. Correct. Go US yep. Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Dang man, that's crazy. I love it. Yeah. Dude, I absolutely love so, that. It was it was, it was pretty neat. Pretty pretty cool to be able to look back and I feel like I saw myself on TV really, you know? And I actually still have the video clippings of it. I have the actual recording on the um hoist cam. And I was in North Carolina because my my stepson graduated from EMT school um, about a month back. And nice. I ran into the pilot in a coffee shop in North Carolina and we started talking about it. So it's just, it's, it's cool, you know? Wow. All right. So yeah. you know what, Ned, since you were talking to the pilot about it, what was, what was kind of that conversation? I'm more curious for myself than anything else. Yeah. So I, I walk into the coffee shop, my wife and I, and as we're walking in, this guy opens the door for us. And as I walk past, I'm like, fuck, I know this guy, you know, I know him. And I just, I can't put it where it's at. And I'm ordering my coffee and he keeps looking at me and I look over and I go, yeah, man, we know each other. And he goes, you're Gabe, right? And I go, yeah. And so we like, you know, reunited. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, I literally, like, cause I just found the VHS tapes that, cause that's how we have them on is the old VHS tapes. And you know, I there's a lot of kids it. right now listening that are like, what is a VHS I, tape? <laughs> I know, go get your VCR, you know, and uh, <laughs> I, I didn't even go to cassette tapes yet. Don't worry. So just VHS. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I was watching, I was actually watching the video um, of the rescue like a month before I went to North Carolina. So it was fresh in my mind. And then I ran into him. So I'm actually going to get it pulled onto a computer and send it to him. Um, <sighs> pilot was Mr. Brooks. So that way he can have the video footage, you know, of the whole thing. So it's, 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 it's real blurry. So it's hard to see anything, but you know, it's, it's Dude, nostalgia stuff, right? Awesome. <laughs> Holy cow. Dude, I love that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. I actually, yeah, I actually found like a whole box of like VHS tapes that I packed away somewhere. I actually had that. When you when you asked me to do this, um, I, everything I did in the Coast Guard's <laughs> box in like Tupperware bins somewhere in a of course corner. It is. And I had to like unearth it and I found this stuff. So you, yeah. me, and the majority of people have their stuff packed in a box away. It yeah. Yep. I yeah. I know. I get it. It's cool. <laughs> Whatever. It is. All right. Well, dang, man. That's freaking badass. I love that. All right. So I'll tell you what. Let's, uh, since we went into that one and the why you joined and how you got through summer school and then doing the same rescue that you saw and the reason you joined, we got to rewind to your yeah. very first rescue. Yes, actually. And I'm not going to lie, man. To me, my first rescue to me was fucking cool as shit because. <laughs> It was before cliff ops was like mandatory. And, and that, well, you know, wait a minute. I, I got to go to, I, I should, I should. Oh yeah, no. Your first case is this award that you got from the Marines too, right? Correct. Do you need to read it? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> go do, do your thing then. I do. I love this stuff. This is why I do it. So you, you earned this award as your very first rescue. Um, so here's this write up, which is, Freaking awesome. It's from the United States Marine Corps. And here's what this one says. United States Marine Corps, Certificate of Accommodation 
Commanding Officer, Marine Aviation Logistics Support Element, Kaneoe, takes pleasure in commending third class aviation survivalman Gabriel Sage, United States Coast Guard, for professional achievement in the performance of his duties during a search and rescue mission on 6 November 2000. Third class aviation survivalman Sage performed his duties in an exemplary and highly professional manner. Tasked with locating three active duty personnel missing from this command following a diving excursion, the search and rescue mission was carried out in an ex expeditious and proficient manner. All three persons were successfully located, stranded on Bird Island, rescued, and returned safely ashore. Third class aviation survivalman Sage, dedication, professionalism, and steadfast devotion to duty likely saved the lives of three shipmates and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard and all sea services. Dude, I don't have anything like that. So that's freaking amazing. Gabe, I love it. It, it, it was interesting and I wasn't expecting the Marines to come and give me something for it. And it actually get, got me a lot of flack because it like being your first rescue and to get recognized. A lot of people were a little frustrated about that. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what was the call? What, I mean, you're on duty. I, first of all, let me ask this. How no. long did you, Oh, you weren't even on duty. Oh, that makes it even better. Okay. Let no. me back up then. How long had you been qualified? <laughs> Maybe a week. Freaking awesome. I love it. Okay. So, so this is for all the brand new rescue swimmers out there. Um, so in, in our world, and I'll try to describe it in case you haven't and nobody understands, we have what's called a dog watch, right? When there's a passing of a watch where there's a period of time where nobody's on a 24 hours duty, somebody has to cover a small, a small window. That's typically like a Monday morning till Monday afternoon, right? Yep. Okay, so it was Monday morning um, from our weekend and we're in the locker room and we haven't established a dog watch yet. And we're in the locker room, just not even kind of just discussing it. And the alarm goes off for an overdue boat off of Connie Oil Island, which is the, um, the east side of the um, um, of, uh, east side of Oahu. And everybody in the shop, everybody's like, ah, oh, shit, overdue boat. I don't want to fucking search all day. You know, that typical, nobody wants to show up on a Monday and spend six hours looking for a boat that was like in somebody's garage with the ER, you know, but just or was parked the whole time and can't be seen. That's yeah. very common. So to all brand new swimmers, never say no. And this is going to come up again in my stories. Never say no to flights because you never know what's going to happen out of it. Never, never run away from the ability to possibly put yourself in an awesome spot. So I remember the alarm going off and everybody's in there complaining. And I go, dude, I'm qualified. I'll take it. They're like, fine, go. It's yours. I'm like, I got this. I'm like, I'm stoked. I'm like, hell yeah, I'm, I'm qualified. I'm about a week or two in from my letter being signed. I'm like, I'm ready. Let's just have some fun. I don't care about what I'm flying on. And again, like I said, this, this whole time, at the time, um, Cliff Ops was not like a standard practice that we would do in Hawaii. Um, and a lot of stations didn't do it unless you're like in the Northwest. Cliff Ops wasn't something that was trained. It really wasn't until they started hitting more hurricane type stuff where they started realizing that that vertical surface type rescue was beneficial in all terrains. So we're flying out around, out around the area that the boat supposedly is missing and we're doing our search pattern. And, you know, like I said, a new swimmer, I knew my crew, but didn't know them that well. And they didn't know me because I'm still a pretty new swimmer and we're cruising along. And I remember I think it was the co-pilot that said, we should just go search all the little islands right off the main one in case the boat's around there. So which Bird, Bird Island is right off the Marine Corps base. Like you could literally stand at the Marine Corps base and see Bird Island. It's not okay. that far away. So we're flying, we start flying around it. And sure enough, like 30 feet up on Bird Island on this sheer cliff, there's three bodies. Like hang, I kind of like on a little platform, just enough for all three of them to kind of huddle around so they weren't really sitting or standing they're just kind of like huddling and holding each other and the waves were coming up and right below them so they're kind of stuck where they were at and so we see them and we're like well shit here it goes you know this is there's there's three people and i just remember the pilot going I, i've never done a cliff rescue and the co-pilot's like i haven't either flight mech me neither and i go i read about it at school 
And that was literally <laughs> how we discussed it in the helicopter. So I'm like, I remember going over this in AST school and the procedure. I go, so I like, I just discussed what we did in school, like how we went through a, a class discussion. Um, pilots obviously had enough knowledge to understand the concept, yeah. but it was nothing that any of us have ever done or practiced. Um, so, you know, I, we set ourselves up after a nice quick discussion and, you know, got ourselves set up into like kind of a direct deployment type position, you know, knowing that we're going to do just right with the quick drop, which is the one we put right around there, right around the victim. And I never disconnect. And I went down and I was able to kind of hang off enough far away where I could kind of like yell and I could figure out which one was needing the most help first. He was pretty hyperthermic. And um, they kind of, they, you know, they kind of brought me in and I brought him up. And I just remember, I, I remember halfway up that hoist. So I put him in, I had him in the hoist. I had my legs around him. And I remember looking up and I remember looking down going, holy shit, I'm doing a rescue. Like it just <laughs> finally hit. I'm like, I'm saving a life right now. Oh my God, and I love it. it was so like unreal for me at the moment because it happened so, this just happened so quick, you know? And as I was coming up into the door, actually, I have a photo that the co-pilot reached over with like the old style camera, the whole click, 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 snap. Yeah, yeah. He actually took a picture of me coming into the door. And I have that photo of me bringing somebody in. So I, I have a cool photo of me bringing like my first person in. Um, and then we, had, we were low on fuel, typical 65. And this is before any engine upgrades. So I was able to hoist the first person. We went and delivered him to the um, Marine Corps base and went back out and did the other two and brought them back. And it just turns out they were out diving. They said all three of them were down there diving and they looked up and their boat was just sinking down towards them. So they <laughs> came to the surface, climbed up on the rock and spent the night. So they're on that rock all night long. And oh my then, yeah, that was it. And so it was, you know, yeah. Um, pulled all three people off. And then that next Monday, um, the Marine Corps came to the station and like did this little ceremony. They had that award written up for me by like that next Monday. And oh my god! Went and did that. So yeah, it's pretty Hell cool. Yeah. Good first rescue. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great first rescue. Yeah, actually, it, so you gotta think about it for a second. The guys that are that are there. Could you imagine being underwater and all of a sudden your boat passes you and you're like, "What? Oh, that's right? not supposed to happen." <laughs> and that's exactly what they said. They said they're all free diving. They're all down together. And they all look up, and one guy just kind of shrugged his shoulders and pointed, and they said their boat was just like sinking past them. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it was two Marines and a Navy guy. So they're all enlisted and they're all like third or second classes, but they just said they just looked up and went, shit. And they didn't want to, none of them felt comfortable enough swimming back to the base. So they said they figured they'd spend the night and they said they heard us all morning flying. So they knew we'd find them eventually. Oh, that's so, so yeah. cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Cool for a rescue, I think. That is Freaking amazing. Well done, sir. You and your crew. I mean, again, stepping out, going outside of a comfort zone, talking it out throughout, like, great brief. Finish it off. It, it was. You know, it was it literally like, yeah, it was like it was totally like you'd say, like they talk about how, you know, sitting in the cabin of the helicopter and everybody discussing. But with no training, we were able to discuss and look for all the issues and problems and understand what we needed to do. So it was, it was pretty cool. It was a fun, fun way to start things out, I guess. Buddy, that is freaking awesome. I love it. Um, all right, so I'm going to go on to another one. But before I do, because this one is actually out of Astoria. This is with the uh, sailing vessel Kama. Is that right? Yes, Kama. 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 Yeah, all these Hawaiian names, uh, man. Sorry. <laughs> Kama. But it, yeah, this is in the 60s. So you were up in, uh, you're up in Astoria, Astoria for this one. Okay. Yeah. Now, all right. I, I gotta I gotta stay in Hawaii for a minute because I want everybody to know that you're you were in Baywatch. That's what I want everybody to know right now. Let's and start the greatest... this. I'm gonna start. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I just want everybody to know that if you ever watched Baywatch and you thought that the girl swimming underwater was hot, you might have been looking at my ass. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So while you were out there, uh, there's a couple scenes in Baywatch that, that like you they got a wig on you. You're all blonde and beautiful, jumping out of the helicopter. <laughs> yes. So at so oh, the, so Baywatch moved 
Baywatch moved to Hawaii from LA and they were starting off with a movie and then had a few small series that they wanted to film. And they sent a couple of us, they sent um, a set of pilots and um, a couple of rescue swimmers, which is Drew Dazzo and myself out to kind of like be liaisons <laughs> to make sure that while they were trying to film, they wouldn't make us look bad. That's all we were really there for. So they were like, at, they were going to use the helicopter statically. And they wanted to kind of like just make, you know, so we wanted to make sure, the Coast Guard wanted to make sure that they didn't make us look stupid. So we were there as liaisons. And Baywatch, filming with them was, was weird because they literally made shit up as they were going along. Like, hey, let's just do this. And they would film it the next day. It was weird. Um, but at one point, they're like, okay, we want all the lifeguards to jump out of the helicopter. And we're like, no, nah, that's not happening. You know, you, you have to be a certified person through a helicopter rescue swimmer school to be able to do this. That's and they right. go, okay, well, they go, you'll do it. They go, where's the nearest girl? Which the only girl we had in the fleet at the time was Sarah Faulkner, yep. who was, I think, in Alabama at that time. So she was, you know, far away. In the, and let's go back real quick. I am in the rescue swimmer world, not what people would expect. I'm small, I'm tiny, you know, 155 pounds. I'm not massive. I have a very small bone structure and I get that. So the guys at Baywatch looked at me and they go, you'll fit as a girl perfectly. And that was it. They go, you're small. I mean, obviously, especially if you stand next to Drew. Drew Dazzo's built like a, like a kind of like a Greek God. He's just got a, a like a yeah. nice, beautiful body. Yeah. Not to sound horrible in that way, but yeah. Hate to love built. him, love to hate him. <laughs> right? And then I'm sitting, standing there next to him. So, of course, they're going to look at me and go, yeah, you'll be the girl. Don't worry. Um, so <laughs> that was it, man. And it was hours of makeup because I got tattoos. So they had to, like, make up my whole body. Um, they had to wig, um, weave a wig into my hair for the scenes. And, yeah, that was, you know, I filmed with them for a while and did some of their jumping out and some of their water scenes real quick. And we had to train with some of the lifeguards, which... Like I was telling you earlier, um, Drew Dazzo actually was the stunt the, the stunt work and the helicopter work for um, Jason Momoa when he was in Baywatch as his first actor. So we got Pretty to work awesome. with them and stuff like that. So yeah, it was, it was a good experience. Something it, different. You know, you you got to share the story about you and Jason Momoa like in in the water, J just for everybody to hear because it. <laughs> I mean, I like it, so everybody else should be enjoying as much as I do. So, yeah, so part of what they needed us to do was when the, um, the lifeguards were actually filming, sometimes they would actually need to be under the helicopter. So we were having to do training of teaching them how to, how to maneuver, where to be, look for rotor wash when a basket comes down. And so there was a part where we were actually having him learn how to put me in the basket so that I could be the victim going up and it wouldn't be one of them getting hoisted, right? So we're in this place called Sand Island where the Coast Guard vessels are moored up. And it's, it's known for hammerheads to be in that area. But, you know, you never see them. But we're in the water together. And he's, like, super nervous because he's under a helicopter. And I go, right when he's putting me in the basket, I go, hey, man, this is like a hammerhead breeding ground. And I remember him just looking at me going, what the fuck would you tell me that? I'm like, that's just for you to live with right now, man. I'm going up. And I remember him just afterwards, we're, like, having lunch. And he was laughing going, Dude, that was such an asshole move to do. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Who knew that he'd become Aquaman, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, what a perfect role. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. I I love Aquaman. I mean, I got a freaking trident on my forearm. Sick. He's like always it. been my my um, and I, I do parkour now. And in the parkour world, we all have our superheroes. And since I was a swimmer, they always called me Aquaman. So it was love actually it. years later. Years later that I realized that that was Jason Momoa. My mom had to call me and remind me. She goes, you do realize who you worked with back then. I didn't even know who it was. Oh, wow. Yeah, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, that's Baywatch time. Nice. Baywatch that's, time. For, for those of you out there who want to laugh that I dressed up like a girl, I had to use the girl's dressing room for all my stuff. So think about what I got to watch all day long while I was getting makeup done. And they all got changed in that same room. So there we go. I can. Well played, sir. On. Well played. <laughs> I'll leave it at that, man. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to bring you back out to uh, Astoria. So while you were in Astoria, you earned yourself an air medal for what, like a pretty gnarly case. Um, 
I mean, ah, let me just go into the award and then you can you can run us through it because that's what I love to hear. I love to hear the real story behind the award. So citation to accompany the award of the Air Medal to Gabriel R. Sage, Aviation Survival Technician, third class, United States Coast Guard. Pennex Sage is cited for heroic achievement in aerial flight on 19 October 2004 while serving as rescue swimmer aboard Coast Guard Helicopter 6005. Immediately responding to the sailing vessel Kama. Distress signal, Petty Officer Sage maintained an alert communication guard gathering critical information as the helicopter flew through low ceilings and rain showers, reducing visibility to one quarter mile during the 235 mile transit off Washington coast to rendezvous with the distressed vessel. The Kama suffered severe damage, including disabled engine, torn sails, cracked hull and several broken windows battling 30 foot seas and 50 knot winds the helicopter crew expertly tracked the signal searching several minutes on scene to locate the 55 foot sailing vessel due to low visibility and monstrous waves that caused the vessel to disappear between waves Perhaps the Sage rapidly recognized hoisting the survivors directly from the vessel would be impossible and bravely volunteered to enter the frigid maelstrom to rescue the survivors from the water. With little on-scene endurance, Petty Officer Sage acted swiftly and decisively in the tumultuous seas, which now crested at 40 feet. With remarkable strength and skill, he gained control of the first survivor, calmed him and prepared him for the basket hoist. After drifting 200 yards in the raging sea, Pedestrian Sage was hoisted and redeployed near the stricken vessel. Just after and during the second survivor was safely hoisted, a breaking wave sent Pedestrian Sage tumbling beneath the surface. Undaunted by the perilous situation, he deftly attached himself to the hoist hook and was lifted to safety. Pastor Sage's actions and skills were instrumental in the rescue of two lives. His courage, judgment, and devotion to duty are most heartily committed in keeping the high assertions of the United States Coast Guard. Gabe, you know I love this stuff, dude. This is awesome. 30-foot seas on scene, 50-knot winds, getting bigger to 40 feet. What the? Dude, that's crazy. Uh, just another day in the Northwest. You know that. Just another day in the Northwest, dude. <laughs> just another day of being a rescue swimmer, huh? <laughs> so give me a rundown, dude. What happened? Well, actually, I would rather start how the day began, if that's okay. Yeah, because, buddy, roll with you, it. You actually, you're reading the rescue, uh, re- reading out the rescue. I don't think I actually even read that before. Um, <laughs> to me, like I said, we, we do this, but how am I... You ever have those moments? I had this moment when I was around my wife's family where we were having a lunch and this fly kept annoying everybody. And so I tried to act like a badass and I ended up swinging my hand out and catching the fly in the air. And everybody oh. looked at me and I'm like, I'm looking at everybody going like, yeah, I'm going to hold this for a minute because everybody saw that happen. It's like those <laughs> badass moments that you look at yourself going, all right, that's pretty fucking cool. It wasn't the rescue that made me stoked about that day. It was what happened or how I got there because I wasn't even supposed to be on duty again. So I was, we were actually having our stand check. So our stand visit, so our, every year we get a, an evaluation from, you know, a, a certain unit to make sure that you're all within standardized capabilities of doing your job. That happens every year. And that was our stand check. And I remember that day, it's kind of like, you know, I was, I, I'm not, I mean, I'll finished with one tour, middle of second tour. I'm like, I am going to fucking bang out some serious numbers and give my just show it all. I'm going to do what I can and see where I stand, right? 100 and some push-ups, 100 and some sit-ups. I remember doing like 20 some pull-ups, 20 some chin-ups. My swim was like remarkable time. Buddy Toe just killed it. Underwaters, you know, and I remember sitting in the locker room afterwards like with like probably like the best stand check numbers I've ever given. And I'm in the locker room and I'm like, "Okay, hey, I'm going to go back to base because I need to go. That's where my lunch is. Everybody else is going to go out to lunch." So I drove back to base. And I get on base, just somebody's like, hey, man, we need another swimmer right now. We have a helicopter out doing a rescue. We need you guys to go out 100 miles and just stand on standby in case something happens during their rescue. So I'm like, all right, sounds good. You know, I'm tired, but 
I got this. You know, we're just going to stand standby in case something happens. So we fly out and we're sitting, you know, 100 miles out, just hanging out. And that helicopter calls us and they're like, we're going to have to bingo. And we think we know where the boat's at. We're sending you guys to go get it. And oh, wait a minute. Hold on. I'm flight... sorry. Real quick. The first helicopter went out to do a full search and never actually found them. No. Oh, man. No way. Okay. So they've been, like, the, the conditions were gnarly. I mean, quarter mile visibility most of the time. Oh, and God. you just, and then in seas like that, even if you flew over the boat, you would miss it, you know? So, because it was 30, 30 feet when we got 100 miles off. And then when we got the 40, uh, next 100 and some miles out, it was growing to like 40 feet. So you'd lose the boat quite often. So they called us and said, hey, we're being going. I remember, I remember even passing them in the air. And the flight mechanic, um, she was awesome, man. Um, she, I think, I, I think it was one of her first rescues ever. Because I remember that was a big part of the whole talk before I went in. Um, but we fly, we're flying out, and um, I think a Canadian P3 found them from the air and directed us to where the boat was at. So it was an actual Canadian P3 that found the vessel. Um, wow. And so this boat, actually, these guys just purchased this boat for $3 million in Hawaii. And they were sailing it to Canada, where they lived. And they got caught in this storm right off the shore of where we we're stationed so they're like just they just the guy just bought this boat it was like brand new to him oh. and uh we get on scene i remember getting on scene and it was it was like watching a movie it was weird because i was like we opened the door and there's a sailboat sitting there but the waves were as high as the mast and when the waves would hit that that the mast because some of them are breaking the boat would lay completely flat in the water like sideways and then flip back up and i remember just looking out going like like, fuck, that doesn't look real. Like, it just looked fake, you know? Just, wow. It's hard to imagine all that happening. And I remember the, the flight mech, she's, like, looking at me, and she's, like, shaking her head, like, no. Like, what the hell? Kind of, you know, we're all just kind of sitting in awe. Um, the, the pilots that we had were just rock star pilots, too, so we were very fortunate, you know, with their skills. Very, um, very um, seasoned pilots. So we had a big talk, you know, because the flight mechanic, she was very nervous, you know, looking at this as being... I think it was her first rescue. And, you know, and I remember the, the, the pilot looking at me going, Gabe, you're going to have to go in. First off, are you even comfortable? Because, you know, we get the final call. If, even if they want us to go, we still make the final call. And he goes, are you even comfortable going in? I, I don't want to make sure. And I'm like, I'm good. You know, in my mind, I'm like, I, I put me in the water. I'm happy. Put me up here. I'd rather be in the water than up here. Sometimes. I just PR'd all of my numbers for Stan team. Put me in, coach. Let's go. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. That's what it was, you know, right? And uh, I'm like, I'm good, but I had to convince the flight mech, you know, like how we were going to go through this procedure. Because she was mo even, she was, she was like, once you're in the water, she goes, I don't know if I can get you back out. And the pilot goes, look, he goes, I can get you there if you can just get the basket or hook to him. You know, that's all we got to worry about. She go he goes, you just need to trust. He goes, just, just con me in and listen. He goes, we got this. Um, but, I, you know, getting delivered into surf like that is not easy. So I actually went down in the strop so that I wasn't connected. And I timed it on the top of a swell so I could just drop. But nice. the idea was we radioed the vessel. And the guys on the vessel were saying that the, the vessel was actually breaking apart. They were in fear of the vessel actually breaking in half because they could see the, the, the cracks coming down the, going through the top of it. And um, I, I, but I told him, I said, don't jump in the water until I signal you. I said, when I send you a signal and or if you see me drop, I want one of you to jump in. That way I can just deal with one at a time. And uh, so I, I get lowered down. I find my timing of getting close enough to the boat, but timing the waves. And I just, you know, let myself slip out of the strop and drop in the water. And he jumps off at the right time. So the swim was not a big swim, but I mean, it was, you can never get close enough in, you know, 30 to 40 foot seas. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a good little swim over. And I remember I was really out of breath because I was like sprinting. But I remember like in school, they're like, I'm, words that were said to me, you got to be an element of calm in a world of chaos. I remember that being said to me by somebody. I and I was like, mind. still out of fucking breath, right? And I'm like, okay, I got to calm this guy down because his eyes were just huge. He's not even wearing a survival suit. We're talking, you know, Northwest waters. And he's in jeans and a sweatshirt. 
and his eyes were huge. And I remember swimming up going, hey, man, everything's cool. This is going to be easy. And that's all I remember saying to him. And he just goes, okay. And that was it. You know, he just said, okay. And he just like relaxed. And I'm like, I'm going to have you turn around, man. And I'm, just, I'm like, I'm going to put you in a basket. I'm like, it's going to be like a roller coaster ride. So just hang on and just enjoy it. Try not to un- think that anything's scary. Just enjoy it. And I remember him just like saying, okay. Just, that's all he would say to me. And, you know, signaled for the basket. It took us about probably 20 minutes for us to figure out how to get the basket in place, get him in and time that. So that first one was about a 20 minute procedure. Um, really weird, you know, cause the helicopter uses like this, this thing where it can hover and it follows the waves. Yeah. Um, it is really strange when you're actually looking down at a helicopter at, at times when you're actually like higher than the blades that are spinning. So yeah. kind of surreal in that kind of concept, you know, and then the basket's floating. So you're like looking at the cable, you know, just trying to figure things out. But you know, we got him in that poor guy when he slung shot out of the water though. I mean, I know he was, I know he felt that one and was pretty scared. And when I saw him do that, I was like, no, oh, hell no, I'm not going up in the basket. That's for sure. You know, when I, when I watched that shit go down, but yeah, so got the first guy up, took about 20 minutes. Um, wasn't too bad. Um, and then the boat was gone. Couldn't see the boat again. The boat ended up moving. I think from that point, it was about a half a mile or a mile away from where we were. Cause the wind was still blowing it. So they were able to do a quick, um, you know, a hook, hook delivery and just pick me up by the hook got in the door flew over to where the second guy was second one actually went super smooth um got me in the water we've had it all timed out only problem was is i got the guy in the basket the basket goes up and the waves started getting a little more aggressive and i remember looking over and i'm like fuck this next wave's gonna break on me so i'm like i'm thinking like i'm gonna try to like swim under it because it's it's like you know what 30 40 feet but the first 15 to 20 feet is like this big, massive wall. There's yeah. like a 10 or 15 foot thing barreling over on top of it. And I'm like, that's still a good 10 feet of fucking wave. And I'm like, I got to figure out how to like duck dive this. I'm going to try to swim under. Which anybody in the rescue swimmer world in a dry suit, trying to swim underwater with your dry suit on, that's maybe not fully purged, um, doesn't work. So I remember like swimming down and I get like looking through my mask and there's like this wall of white water coming at me. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to curl up and do like a ball and take it, right? Because I've surfed. I've, hit, I've, I've surfed in Hawaii. I've taken some pretty big hits. So I'm like, I'm going to curl up in a ball. And when the water hit me, man, I, I couldn't hold my, 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 I couldn't hold that curl up. Like I literally just opened up into a rag doll. And just next thing I know, I'm just getting thrashed. And I'm just rolling underwater. And I'm like, shit, this is, this is, this is heavy. This is a heavy hit. And it's going and it's going and it's going. And I'm like, this is taking a long time. And I remember like finally when things calmed down, cause I figured if I just relaxed, I knew that my dry suit would start pulling me up. Cause I, I was getting really disoriented. And I remember like, you know, I'm just like, I'm just going to hang tight in here. And next thing I know things are starting to calm down. And I just, it took about probably another eight seconds of just kicking to the surface to get back up. So it just, it wow. thrashed me pretty far. Um, it moved me about a quarter mile. You know, oh um, under, you know, Lord. yeah, it was a good movement. I couldn't see the helicopter. Like I actually, I, I lost the visual of the helicopter at that point. So then at that point, I'm like, okay, I need to start going through my emergency procedures. I'm like, I'm thinking about maybe pulling out a flare. Do I get my strobe? And as I was like going through that stuff, I turn around and the hook hits me in the back of the head. Like they found me and they, they the hook just smacked me. And I grabbed the hook, I hook in, and the next wave's coming. And they, like, literally, like, it's like, you know, seeing a movie, sucked right out the back of the wave and came up. So it was it was a pretty, you know, neat aspect to be in the water, I guess. It was fun. Um, uh, it was a neat things. aspect. I, thank you. <laughs> I, wow. <laughs> I mean, I know I, I, people, you know, I've talked to swimmers that have been in high seas. You know, I know it's one of those things as a rescue swimmer where I'm like, man, I, I can't wait for that big fucking day. If I had to do it again, I would, but I wouldn't want to. Um, there was a moment that was the whole shit, this could be it. You know, I'm thinking 200, you know, 230 miles offshore. It's cold. I'm tired. And I couldn't find the helicopter. And there was a moment where I was like, fuck, this is, this is kind of intense. Um, and then, then your job's not done. I mean, there's another two hours of flight or more. And I've got hyperthermic guys, you know, going back. But um, 
a cool twist to the whole thing. So my family lived in Oregon at the time, like my parents. And so I did this rescue and I fly back, get on with our day. We still had our stand check going through the procedure. And my mom calls me that night and she goes, holy shit, I just saw you on the news. This guy's being interviewed. And he's like saying that he was in the middle of the ocean and this guy just swam up and said, hey man, everything's cool. And he goes, and he, to him, it was like so surreal because to him, he's like, the world's coming to an end. In his mind, you know, shit, I'm jumping in the ocean. I'm going to die. And this guy just out of nowhere is like, hey, man, everything's cool. This is going to be fun. And he goes, and the guy's on the news going like, I just felt comfortable. This guy's named Gabe Sage. And my mom was like, holy shit, that's my son, you know? So kind of you know, neat little neat little aspect to her calling me that night because she didn't even know I did it. So, oh, yeah. God, that's amazing. Dude, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Fun stuff. Oh, Gabe, this is why I do this, man. I love these stories. I can't get enough of them. But damn, I'm not going to lie, man. Awesome. That period in Astoria was like kind of like at the top of my thing because I ended up getting nominated for um, the Coast Guard Foundation Award for that rescue. Yeah. And um, before I went to the foundation dinner, like a week before that, I did another rescue right there out of the um, mouth of the Columbia and pulled 12 people off of a boat right before it flipped over. Oh, and oh while, my I was, God. while I was at my foundation award, so, okay, so I'm at the foundation award and I'm ready to, they're getting ready to do the whole award ceremony. And a, the, the, one of the ladies that works there, the, um, that was working for the food service fell and smacked her head open. So I go over and I'm giving her like first aid. And as I'm going up on stage, I'm like, got blood on my uniform <sighs> because I just did this. And the guys, the guy up there, the captain's like reading off my foundation award and he goes, and he just got nominated and accepted for foundation award next year for the rescue he did like two weeks ago. So I got foundation award like two years in a row. So it was just, it was a really weird time at that time in, in Astoria, you know, I just, wow. it, was, it was fun and good stuff. So. All right. Uh, do indulge a little bit. 12 people in a boat at the edge of the Columbia river. What? Uh, it was so the boat it was a really foggy morning. I remember when the alarm went off. Um, I remember walking outside the shop and you couldn't even see the helicopter out on the plat. I'm like, the alarm's going off. I'm like, well, fuck, we're not going anywhere. We can't even see the helicopter. And we we were walking out and we go, I find the pilots. I'm like, look, this boat is like, they just hit ground. They're saying it's going to tip. And there's 12 people with kids on board. So I go, we believe that the the risk versus gain is there if you're willing to fly. We're all like, let's do it. So it was like a full on like instrument only out to the bar because we couldn't see anything as we're flying out, hoping that once we got out a little further that there'd be patches open up in the fog. And as we're going out, there's sections like patching sections where like it would start to clear up and then fog over again. So it's like flying in a cloud the entire time. And then we wow. get there where the boat is at and there it is, the boat's nose to the sand. And every time the wave hits it, the boat's like rolling you know, high on its side. So it's getting ready to flip. So I, and there's, like I said, kids and elderly on board. So there was patches of like sun coming through every once in a while. So I said, put me down on the boat and we're going to do a trail line. That way, if I lose you guys in the fog, the trail line will keep contact of the helicopter at all times. I'll know where you are and you'll know where I'm at. Um, so I go down to the boat and I trail line basket and every, and it turns out it was the weight of the people that kept it from flipping. So I feel like the first person going off and then the boat get a little more rocky and each wave. And I'd have to like time it. Like every time a wave would break, I'd have to like kind of stop and huddle, hold myself from the boat, you know, as it's, as it's listing over and next person, next person, each person I'm going, shit, this boat's going to go over. I'm like starting to look for an escape route at this point. And this whole time the trail lines connected. So I don't want to lose. And th there's times that I wouldn't see the helicopter fog would like go by and the helicopter would be like sucked up by the fog. And it's just a line going up to the cloud. And then finally get everybody off. And I remember I disconnected the trail line. I disconnected the basket and hooked on because I didn't want to go up in the basket. And once we got airborne and me going up, the boat actually ended up rolling over. So it's like, it was the weight of the people holding it down. But it was, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a real fun one. It was, it was, it was quite adventurous. And then people just packed on top of each other inside the helicopter. So it was pretty cool. So, oh my god, yeah. Gabe! That's freaking badass, dude. <laughs> Another day at the job, right? <laughs> Another day in the office.
damn, that is awesome. Man, thanks for sharing that one. That it's well done to you and the crew. Actually, both those yeah, teams. Let me let me kick all the way back to the last one you talked about. Amazing crew. Wow. And if that was her first rescue, hitting you in the back of the head with the hook. Absolutely. 30 to 40 foot waves. Well done. Well done. I, I that tell is not everybody, an easy look, thing to do. We had we have a pretty intense job. But at the end of the day, I always saw myself as nothing more than a worm on the end of the hook or an overpaid Labrador retriever, man. I couldn't do shit if it wasn't for the people that brought us there and brought us back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's the truth. If, if It's the flight mix and the pilots. We have a special skill, but our skill is useless without what they bring to the table. And that is way more important. So, yeah. yep. absolutely. The cruiser, yeah. cruiser it, man. Yep. Can't agree more. I, I I'm totally on board with that. I, I love every one of my flight max and pilots that I've ever flown with. They just yep. it's been amazing. So freaking well done. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. Let me, let me change a little bit. Uh, you went down to Katrina with a whole bunch of the rest of the guys. Yes. Were you in a story yes. at the time? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was. And the, the decision behind me going was the fact that I was dual qualified 60s and 65s. Oh, okay. Nice. So it helped, you know, that, that, cause at that time, this was before, like they really knew it was going on. This was like, Hey, this makes sense. You're dual qualified. You're going to go. Nice. So that's why okay. I got picked for it. Got it. All right. Um, I'll tell you what, like we, we've heard a bunch of stories from a bunch of the guys that have been down there. I love every one of the stories. If you have like a top two or three that, that stand out to you while you were there, have that. If, if it's okay, my favorite. Done. It, I like it. it can be it's not vulgar but it can be a little it's a little like i said to me man I, a lot of people look back at what we did as he, like they use the word hero right what we did but we had a job i look i, I really don't look back at a lot of what we did is as heroic because it's just a job that we were trained to do is a skill that we were able to perform and we were built to do this i look back on moments during these rescues because there's some bad ones you know and I've, I've talked to you before this i was very nervous about doing this um i was diagnosed with ptsd you know and part of the stuff i saw in katrina comes from that i still have nightmares last night knowing i was talking today i didn't sleep i had nightmares last night because it was bringing stuff up and that's part of the process and i love that i get to carry that because to me it's a badge that i get to carry because other people come back with worse stuff but i look back at the things that we did and some of them are like said either how they turn back around how like the, the cool twists or even the moments in in these moments where people are like at their where they think that death is at their doorstep and how they see things or what they say so to me i look back on that so i'd love to hit one that happened there when i was in katrina that was a moment that i'll never forget but it is a little a little weird so i'm okay you're okay it. with that I'm very All much right, okay so with it. I was about probably about a week in to Katrina. So at this point, you know, I was there about a day after it hit. And the big, I don't want to say the heavy load, but it was kind of like now finding the people that were trying to hang out and realize that it was time to go. And so a lot of these were people that were living in apartment buildings that the first four, first or second level was full. So they all went to the upper level. Then they all realized, shit, it's not going to drain and we're stuck. So this rescue was actually out of a window and we were, I was pulling people out of a window from an apartment building. Um, so it was a kind of a direct deployment, you know, go down. I broke the window with the ax, cleaned everything up, make sure nothing is sharp. Um, had my feet at the window seal, reach this quick drop into each person one at a time, pull them out the window, go up to the helicopter. So we were kind of going through that. And I got about to the third, third or about the third or fourth person. And she was, she was a little heavy set, and probably wasn't wearing exactly what she should be wearing in an emergency situation. You know, she was wearing a very crop top shirt, no bra, and a really small skirt. And I remember even thinking in my mind when I was getting ready to do this rescue, like, probably not what I would have picked in a rescue scenario or like to survive in. But you know, what are you gonna do? So. As I put the quick drop around her, it pulled her shirt up, unfortunately. 
So it ended up exposing her entire chest, which like I said, she had no bra on. So as I was bringing her out, how we're supposed to do it is we're supposed to wrap our legs around the person so we can keep control. So she freaks and jumps out at the same time and wraps her legs around me. <laughs> and so it kind of becomes like a weird physical grip, but she ended up being a lot higher than she should. Cause if that happens, she's no longer with her head, like where my chest is so I can grab on. So now her head's above me. Now, mind you, I just told you that her shirt's been pulled up. So as I'm going up, it's nothing but these boobs in my face. Right. And I remember kind of like trying to hold her and I'm like, shit, this is physical grip in a way. Because if I dropped her, she wouldn't drop, but it would be a quick load on the quick drop. But I'm like trying to hold her. And I'm like, like I said, I'm not, I'm a small guy. So, you know, I'm doing the best I can, but I'm strong. So I got this. But I remember looking down going, why is she wearing a thong? You know, I remember like going through my head, like this, this girl's in a thong right now. And I'm like, and it's not a very big thong. So I'm like, this is what I'm seeing at this moment. It's like, it's so surreal. And as I'm going into the helicopter, we get up and how it works is the flight mechanic turns them around and brings them in first. Now, mind you, my positioning is not quite orthodox. So how we would normally do it. So as he pulls her in, she falls down. I'm between her legs. She falls on her back. I fall face first. And she's like on her back, like screaming, it's okay, baby, I got you. And I remember the guys in the helicopter like that we just rescued are all looking at me like, the fuck is going on right now? And I'm just like, I can't do anything. I'm just stuck right now in this. This is it. This is where I'm living right now. And so, you know, it was, I was able to be a really important part of moment of her life and my, my, my moment, my life. And we shared that. And I'm not, I'm never going to forget that moment. So, you know, some, some shit went down in Katrina. I'm not going to lie, but that is one that I'll never forget. Oh my God, so, dude. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> so, and actually, I actually had my birthday while I was there. And oh, the nice. company Red Dog, the company, um, Red Dog was a company that filmed for, um, they ended up being the um, company that showed all the TV series for, I think it was Discovery Channel. So the company Red Dog was there and I knew the, the film, the camera guy, because he actually was with us in Astoria for a really long time. And like I said, I had a lot of stuff happen in Astoria. So um, he was filming a lot of the stuff that I was doing while we we're there. So he knew me. So he took me out on my birthday. I got to fly with him on my birthday and nice. got to actually do like an actual red dog in mean, a discovery channel series, pulling a guy and a bunch of dogs out of a school, you know, while I was there. So it was a cool little thing. So. Wow. Yeah, good stuff. Dude, that's great, man. <laughs> Dude, I can't get enough. You know, it's stories like that, that you never hear about. That's, what I love about yes. like listening to you guys and everybody else that's been doing this for so long, you just, dude, that story is awesome. Okay. Uh, it's these, awesome. Like I said, those, to me, that's, that's what made our job. And these yeah. are the things that nobody ever gets to hear about. I mean, we do it in the shop, but it's stuff that, that this is real. That's the stuff that really happens. You know, totally. I, I remember pulling a, a 600 pound man out of a house in a flooded town. And I remember asking him like, dude, why are you fucking naked? And I remember him looking back at me going, I'm 600 pounds. How the fuck am I going to dress myself? And I remember just like that conversation of this dude in this house trying to figure out how to, you can't hoist 600 pounds plus, nope. you know, so figuring out how to rescue him. And then while I'm trying to float his body in a river that's rushing through this town, I find a piece of bark dust on his ass. And I'm like picking the bark dust off his ass while I'm waiting for a boat to come by, you know, like oh those moments. Gosh never you never you know you don't ever hear about those but those really happen you know you can't make it up either the that's thing. the greatest part you about it. you cannot <laughs> make this up like yeah you can't make it up then that guy looks back at you after you threw him in a boat floating him through the water and he goes hey can you get my six dogs out of the house and you're throwing dogs across the house at a paramedic i mean like things like that there's just you just never that's shit that really happens man that's the fun oh stuff my so. gosh. oh dude that is hilarious Oh, Gabe, I'm glad you told me that. That just made my day. It really did. So. <laughs> no, um, you're right. Though Katrina was Katrina was weird. Um, my first rescue actually was a um, was a an elderly home, and they were all abandoned. So when I you know when I got there, um, I got put down actually in a cemetery. Tons of cemeteries in New Orleans. 
I remember walking through the cemetery in about waist deep water, just kind of like, it was kind of just weird, you know? Yeah. I see yeah. a horse. I watch a horse walk down the street, you know, because you're like, okay, there, there, there's a horse. And I'm going in and I, I was walking because people were non-ambulatory. So I'm like carrying them out one at a time and hoisting them up. And I remember this one guy and he's, he's, he has no teeth and I'm walking out with him and this big snake goes swimming by and he just looks at me and he's like, it's by you. And I thought he was saying it's by you, but he was saying it's a by you. And I remember I didn't even flinch. I just like watched this snake swim by and he just like looking at it. And I'm thinking like, this guy's like, in his mind, he was probably going to die that day in his mind. And I'm like carrying him out and we're like looking at a snake and laughing together. You know, it's just, you know, some weird shit happens, you know? Dude, that is crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh, Gabe. Hey, you know what? I, I, let me touch on one thing because it, 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 as much as I love laughing at all this stuff, I do get it. There was some really hard stuff that people had to deal with down there. You mentioned in the beginning with the PTSD, there were guys that had a hard time coming out of it. And, you know, I'm so thankful that you came on to one, tell the stories that you've gotten and, and talk about this with me because I, one, I love to get it. And I love to, to show off your stories. I really do. It's why I do this. So, thank you. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Seriously. Like, I appreciate yeah. it. So I'm sorry you That's had a not, couple of rough times. You know. Yeah. Well, like I say, you know, you've done it. I mean, it's not, it's not always easy. And I, I tried to think that I was doing the right thing by pushing on, but you know, sometimes you can't, you have to face the things that you deal with and try to get through them. And I started therapy back in 2013 and I still see the same therapist today. So, you right know, it's, it's important. Hey, good. Gotta, it is. Self-care is gotta, important, man. You got to take care of your mind. You got to keep your mind right. hundred percent. Like, yep. And, and yep. everybody that does this job knows that the people that don't do this job, they don't, I, I'm going to call it a little ignorance. You just don't get it. And it's not that you don't get it because you don't want to, it's that you haven't lived it yet. And you don't, you're not there yep. where we've been. So that's all. So I get yeah. it. But you know what? I, I will say that out of those stories that you told me, freaking hilarious. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, Gabe. So they, like, I love those stories. Uh, you said that, you know, that one was that one in particular one out of Katrina was a very memorable case for you. So you have another memorable rescue of saving 26 people dude yes. where is that uh, so, and what is that so back to hawaii again and i think it was actually my second rescue like i said Wait, I oh that was your a, very second rescue freaking... correct so oh my gosh what um yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so back again to whoever's a new swimmer don't ever take away somebody don't don't ever be afraid to take somebody's duty because you never know what might happen so no so this day was um so this day was it was a friday and typically whoever has friday work especially back in hawaii if we weren't surfing by like nine in the morning something was wrong that day you know that's kind of like how the thought process was back then <laughs> so it was it was around nine and we're trying to get out the door you know we're trying to all get out the door finishing up whatever maintenance whoever's going to stay behind and the duty guy, um, the guy that was on on call that day, um, was our first class and had a, just an ass load of paperwork. And he's like, hey, man, I got a whale sanctuary flight if anybody's willing to take it so I can get my paperwork done. And I'll, I mean, who's going to say yes to that shit, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I did. I'm like, I'm like, fuck yeah, man. I'm like, whale sanctuary? You tell me I got to fly in a helicopter and look at whales? I'll get paid for that shit. I'm, a new, I'm newly qualified. Let's do this. So... I, I take the flight. Now, quick backstory, just so you know. Um, you know, I was I was previously married, and the person I was married to was actually from Japan. And I so I speak some Japanese. So that's an important aspect of this entire thing altogether. So we we take off, and as we take off, I see a Japanese boat cruising on. They're flying the Japanese flag. And I'm like, hey, let's go fly by that real quick. That's cool. You don't see that very often. And as we're flying by, I'm in the door and I'm like waving at everybody on the boat. Right. So I'm like, hey, how's it going? Cool Japanese boat. I haven't seen one of those. You know, wife's from Japan. I speak some Japanese. That's cool. You know. So we fly over to Maui 
and it's a it's a pretty rough day it's like raining that day the seas are probably like around eight or nine feet nothing big but i mean it's just choppy just choppy and we're flying around maui and we're getting low on our fuel we've been flying for an hour or so and we get a radio call from sector saying hey there's um an ELT going off for a submarine. And typically, um, there's like little submarines that are like part of tours out of Waikiki. Oh, and so okay. we're thinking like, you know, when they disconnect or lose their connection, it'll send off an ELT. It's, it happens. You know, it's not something that I don't want to say is common, but like it, it wasn't like it didn't have any big red flags. Like, OK, well, we're heading back. We'll go take a look. And I'm in the back and the pilot goes, Gabe, I want you to come up here between the seats, man. And I, I'm like, okay. And I get up there and he goes, what is that? And I go, that's a fucking nuclear submarine offshore. I'm like, there's a fucking nuke out there. That's a nuclear sub. That's like a full class thing going. And so um, he's like, all right. He goes, the ELT is coming from that thing. I'm like, shit, I'm getting dressed. So I go in the back and I start dressing out. And as we get closer, you know, the subs there, all we see is just fuel lines and life rafts fucking like six life rafts just scattered and then there's debris everywhere just shit everywhere in the water what and so we're we're trying to figure out like is the sub sinking we're like trying to go through it all and the pilot goes gay hey, man i'm bingo i have no fuel what the fuck do you want me to do with you and i'm like just put me down in what we consider the center go get more swimmers and meet me back out here i'm like that's that's the best i could come up with so they drop me down dead center of this debris line and I swim to the first life raft. And I remember poking my head inside and it was like all these kids, like teenage kids. And they're like laughing and jumping around, which at the time I wasn't allowed to disclose this, you know? And so oh, then I, nice. I grabbed that life raft. I grabbed that life raft in the line and I started pulling it with me to the next life raft. And I look inside and there's like people packed in that one. So I tie those together. I go to another life raft, so I'm not swimming two together, and I swim that one over, and I look inside that one, and there's a guy in there, like, screaming, and with another, like, two other people, and then I grab the next one, so I just go and get, like, all the life rafts kind of put together, and then I start kind of assessing, like, what I've got, and by that time, um, the small boat, which is why I never received an award for this, the small boat came out, and I ended up getting, so one guy had a busted collarbone, um, and then tons of fuel in hill and you know people suck bringing in fuel but it was the exact same fucking fishing boat that was a japanese one that we were waving at an hour before that oh my so gosh what happened yeah exactly right so i was waving at these kids an hour and a half before this and now i'm in the water with all of them and so what happened is the nuclear sub was doing a tour and they had civilians on board and they have this procedure where they do like a periscope check and then they do this rapid ascent and you ever seen like the videos of the on the submarine coming up out of the water yeah so they did this procedure but they didn't do a proper check and when they came up they literally went straight through the middle of this fucking boat like from the bottom of it straight through and just torpedoed through the thing so the only people so i was able to recover 26 people to the small boat some i swam some i was able to hand across and then before the helicopter even made it back on scene, um, I forget the number. I want to say it was like 11 or something that were never recovered. Um, oh, wow. And the people on the boat knew it because they closed the doors behind them like you're, they're supposed to, not realizing that they trapped them in the boat as it sank. So they were oh, trapped inside no. their, their areas. You know, they thought they were doing the right thing. That's what you're supposed to do. Close a hatch, drink water, right? Yeah. Um, trapped them. And so the boat sank, they said, in like, matters of seconds i mean it was it was obliterated um and then i ended up riding the small boat back in so i could maintain care you know of the people that i had and that when the helicopters got on scene and then from that point it was just interviews and shit which was kind of cool since i spoke japanese i did interviews in japan for japanese speaking Jap some japanese you know um I, I did. It was like weird, like so many interviews. Like at one point I did an interview with like with Wolf Blitzer, who was supposed to be like this big guy at the time. And I remember them coming afterwards like, how was that interview? I'm like, with who? You know, just it didn't even matter. I just they literally had a PR guy come to me and like give me a sheet and said, this is what you're allowed to say, because this is an international incident that happened with a military vessel from the U.S. Oh, and it was like what? super, super touchy because, you know, it was a, a American 
naval, you know, um, a submarine that took out a civilian um, civilian craft. So it was a pretty touchy thing. So nothing was ever brought up about it. That's why. So it was like one of those rescues that just was hush hush and put under the rug. But I mean, the fact that I spoke Japanese, I'm the only one in the shop that knew how to speak Japanese. So I was able to communicate with everybody. I knew everything that was going on. I was able to talk to the kids. I was able to, you know, I had everything figured out. It was, so, it was like that rock star moment again. Like, I got this shit on lock right now. And I didn't even need a fucking helicopter to get back, you know? Uh. So it was, it, that, to me, that was, that was a big memorable moment. Because, you know, one, the amount, to have that many people, you know, yeah. triage. Seas were about eight feet, you know, just rough seas, raining, you know, just trying to figure out a scenario, figuring it out on the spot by yourself. You know, I was there for a good 20, 30 minutes before anything else. So it was just a cool, you know, cool experience to be able to go through and start your career with, you know? Dang. As your second yeah. rescue. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's freaking awesome. Dude, thank you for sharing that one, man. That's that's pretty. Yeah, I, I could say that's a memorable case. I'd remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, dude, that's awesome. All right, my friends. Well, guess what? We're going to do one more. And uh, this one in particular is is one that stands out to you. And you know what? Um, I'm just going to let you run with it. It's all you, my friend. Beautiful. All right. So this one here is, I, I want to say memorable, but it was probably one of the best in my mind, learning or teaching moments as a swimmer. You know, I was a, I wasn't a brand new third, but still fairly new. And being in that position in a helicopter with pilots and a flight mech that all outrank you. And also in the concept that, you know, swimmers are always gung-ho. So that concept is always there. So we, we were called out on a Friday afternoon. Again, I was like, I think I was on dog watch. I wasn't even supposed to be on duty that day. My duty was actually on Sunday. So I wasn't even supposed to be. No, so it was a Thursday. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had Thursday off going duty. Sunday oncoming duty, which means I didn't have to work on Friday. So Thursday evening, um, end of the duty day. So we're all tired, we're all done, and we get called for a um a kayaker off the North Shore that was, you know, that went out and didn't come back. And this is on a, a winter day. So the North Shore was gonna have some big swell. It was like 20, 20 to 30 foot, you know, growing swell out there. So it was a big day in the area that he the area that he went out at is on the town of Haleiwa. There's like a, a boat channel there. So obviously when the waves get big, that channel becomes pretty massive, like a fast river, you know, pushing back out because that water has to go somewhere. So I knew the current that day back into the river was pretty bad. So as we're flying out, I'm looking at like, okay, a guy on a kayak, how's he going to get in? That's my mindset. We fly out there and we find the guy on the kayak. He's just sitting in his kayak. And he keeps, we're circling around him and he just kind of keeps putting his thumb up. Now, mind you, before we actually, as we're flying out there, I remember the pilot, as we're getting out over the water, goes, Gabe, don't fucking ask to go in the water. I don't want to hear this shit today. Don't sit there and say, I'm going in. He goes, let's just figure it out and let's just get home. So I remember he was, we were all tired. And I'm not discrediting the pilot. It's just, you know, we get tired and I get that, you know? And he didn't want to have some eager third class going, put me in coach. You know, it's the last thing they fucking want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> um so I, but it's I, so I, I true it's so saying. true i'm just saying it's so true <laughs> i didn't want to you know so I, I i'm not i was not offended by that i get it but i just remember that was an important thing of what he said because it carries weight to how this story goes um so we're flying over the kayak he's giving us a thumbs up the flight mech and i both agreed hey we want to just trail on a radio to the guy let's just make comms with him to make sure he's okay so we drop a radio down it's on the channel and we're like, hey, this is Coast Guard. Are you needing assistance? And he would just click on and go, I'm okay. That's all he would say. I'm okay. He never said anything else. He said it about four or five times. And the pilot goes, all right, we made comms. Call back to sector. Sector, we've made, we've established comms with the guy. He says he's okay. What's the word? And the sector's like, all right, RTB. You know, you made comms. Everything's good. So we're turning around and RTB is returned to base. We're flying back to the base now. And I remember looking around and I'm looking at the waves and I'm like, okay, it's going to get big tonight. It's not going to get any smaller till tomorrow, like late tomorrow afternoon. And I'm like, how the fuck is this guy going to get in? And I go, sir, turn around. And he goes, what? And I go, 
turn the helicopter around. This is wrong. I go, what if he's having a medical emergency and he can't speak? What if there's other factors that we don't know? This guy, I'm like, tell me right now how he, how you think he's going to make it back in. I go, I can't think of one. And if you can, I'm happy to go home. But if you can't, you need to listen to me. I said, my gut is saying we have to fucking go back. So we, he, he, the flight mech goes to my side. You're right. He might have a medical emergency. We need to find out. Pilot goes, all right, what the fuck do you want then? And like I said, it was frustration. I mean, there was frustration in the cabin because a third was like literally pressing the pilot now. Yeah. And I go, just put me in the water. I'm not going to hoist him. I'm going to get him on a boat. Just put me in the water. Let me figure shit out. What if he's embarrassed? What if he doesn't want his friends to know he's a local? What if, I'm like, we don't know. Just let me get this guy over to a boat. Find a boat while I'm talking to him. Direct it over. I'll tie him up. So the pilot's like, fine, you got five minutes. Go over there. I free fall in. I swim over to the guy. Helicopter takes off to go try to direct a boat over. I, walk, I swim to the guy. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? He's like, I said I'm fine. And I go, okay, what's your plan? And he goes, I'm just going to hang out, and I'm going to head in when I feel it. And I go, where? How do you plan on getting in? I'm like, you're a local. I think you understand what you're looking at here. I'm like, how do you plan on getting in? And he goes, I'm just going to wait for it to calm down, and I'll paddle in when I feel better. I go, okay you do know that it's not going to get small until tomorrow. So you're going to have to wait the night. He goes, that's fine. I go, all right. So I swam over and I put my arms and legs around the front of his kayak and just held on. He goes, what the fuck are you doing, man? I go, well, if you're going to hang out tonight, I'm going to hang out with you. That way we can keep radio comms back to sector and we don't have to send another helicopter out because flying a helicopter is fucking dangerous. I go, so I'll just hang out with you so we can do comms. When it calms down, they'll come get me tomorrow on their morning flight. You can go in after the waves die down and things are cool. And at least we can just hang out for the night. And the guy's like, you're going to fucking hang out all night with me. And I go, why not? I'm like, it's a beautiful night, man. We can do this, right? And he goes, dude, I'm not going to let you sit here all night with me. And I go, well, I'm not going to let you sit here either. I go, that boat's on its way over. Let's just tie up and get you in because you can't paddle in. The guy, after a couple minutes of kind of pushing it, he goes, fine, whatever. Guy ties up, gets in the helicopter, pilots for the most part. What'd you tell him? I told him I wanted to tie the boat up. Kind of a little frustration in the helicopter because I kind of, it's kind of like, okay, he got his way. Swimmer got in the water kind of concept. Pilot didn't really think that there was much to it and why, but, you know, got him in. Flew home, flew home. Didn't go to work on Friday because it was my, my day off. Sunday duty. Sunday or Monday morning, I'm supposed to go home first thing in the morning. And my chief comes in. He's like, you can't leave, Gabe. And I go, why? And he goes, you can't leave. I was told you have to stay. I'm like, all right. So I go to our, you know, next boss, next up, next up boss, boss. I, I want to go home. No, man. I was told also you can't leave today. Shit. Okay. Next thing you know, they're ringing three bells. Admiral's on board. And I'm like, fuck, I'm going to get stuck in an all hands talking about deep water and all the new boats they're creating. And I had to be part of the crew so they could have a thousand bodies out here. So the shit looks good. And I'm like, I'm fucking tired. I just got off of duty, you know? So I'm standing in there and he goes, he, the, the admiral walks up and he goes, I need Gabe Sage up here right now. And I walk up there. I'm like, oh, shit, what did I just do? And he starts reading this award. Now, this award, you have it. I'm going to let you read it um, as soon as I'm, I'm going to let you read it in a minute. But um, long story short, the guy. No, 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 no. Hey, time out. Do no, not I, make I a have long, to, man. No, do not make a long story short. Make okay. it long. Okay. So. <laughs> The guy planned on killing himself that night. That was his plan. He went out there to end his life. And he went home that evening and went to his wife and said, I decided not to because somebody made me understand that it wasn't worth it. They were going to give me their time. And exactly, right? <laughs> you know, you don't realize how important your voice is in a helicopter. You don't realize how important your knowledge of your skill and your skill set is to uh, you know that others that don't understand it if i didn't speak up that guy would have died or could have and you know he said that i was the reason why he decided not to so the big thing in this is as a swimmer as a crew member what you think what you say and what you feel in that helicopter could literally be the thing that saves your life your crew's life or somebody else's. So it was a, to me, that's, that's something that I just will never, I, it, it's important. It's really important. So Damn, yeah, I'll let you read the rest on um, the, the award. Cause the award on, on honestly, 
the award doesn't give it justice. You know, the, the Admiral wasn't there, but you know, what he gave me uh, was amazing. You know, and the pilot came up to me afterwards and shook my hand and apologized and said, I'm going to do my job different from this point on. And he did, you know? So yeah, there you go. <laughs> Gabe, that is, that is amazing. That That's awesome. Uh, you know what, without further ado, let me, let me just read this. Commander 14th Coast Guard District, Honolulu, Hawaii. Dear Petty Officer Sage, please accept my sincere appreciation in your, for your performance of duty on 19 February 2004 while attempting to assist a disorientated kayaker. I was pleased to hear that you were able to convince the distraught young man of the danger he was in and persuade him to board a catamaran vessel that had been diverted to assist. I understand the young man was depressed and potentially suicidal. You provided the critical intervention that probably saved his life. I'm confident after seeing the efforts being expended to help him and having you deployed from the helicopter to express your personal concern played a tremendous role in his decision to eventually comply with the request and voluntarily terminate his ill-advised voyage. I want to assure you that I understand the risk that you and the other aviators take every day to save others. I appreciate your professionalism and aggressive prosecution of our search and rescue mission in this unique environment. I also appreciate the efforts it takes for you to maintain yourself in peak condition, ready to perform at a moment's notice. Thank you again for a job well done. Sincerely, Rear Admiral, U.S. Coast Guard, C.D. Worcester. Gabe, that's yeah, I guess the lady, the lady reached out to him. So he heard about this through her. So he never even got to hear what we did. You know, he wrote that up that weekend based on what he told heard from the lady, the the wife. So wow. Like I said, uh, to me, that's one of those things that it was a big turning point, and I think shifted a lot of the way that I performed or did my job in the helicopter. Because your voice is so important, whether you're a brand new third, seasoned or burnt out. A voice of anybody never ever shut anybody down when they have something to say or think about what we're doing out there because it it does come down to life and death sometimes. Yeah. So it's very important. Gabe, yeah, that's that's unreal, dude. <laughs> I, I you know, I, I'm gonna throw it out to you, you know, just to to end it. I know you just gave some amazing advice and I appreciate it. Is there anything else that you would tell any of the younger swimmers that are out there still doing the job? Mental health, that's the big one, man. If you come back from a rescue that was at any way seemed a little rough, you know, um, and that comes with anything, just from something maybe you see, um, even if it's, you know, just, you know, you saw it from a glance. I've had to do car accidents, pulling people out of car wrecks, you know, um, body recoveries, because there's no other way, you know, I wish I would have gone back a little sooner and spent a little more time just discussing those. And if you're not the one asking for the help, look for your fellow swimmers. If you think that they tell you a story and you're looking at going shit, don't disregard the fact that maybe what they saw is still shit in the back of their mind years later. So start talking to them about it now, discuss that stuff, get it down, get it out. Cause it, yeah. it, it will haunt you. I did. I held it in. You know, I had a bad case go down, a real bad case, and had to turn around and do another one right after. When I landed, I was a hero because of what I just did, but nobody would talk about what happened before. And that haunts me. You know, being told you're a hero when you just had shit go down that wasn't is something that is very heavy to carry. And I hate the word hero now because of it. So, you know, be there for each other because this job at some point – the job ends, but what you go through, what you see, what you feel, what you remember, that doesn't end. That stays with you. So it's important. I appreciate that, man. That was a heavy way to end, right? Yeah, it's all good. That's <laughs> Moving all to good. the face. That's it, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what? Hey, listen, I, I'm going to throw something back to you, man. And, and I truly mean this. And I mean this when I say this to you specifically, is don't, don't take away that word hero. You put your life on the line every day. You know, one of the biggest things that I say here, and I, and it sticks with me, is that those people in distress, they pray for a miracle. They get you. They got you. 
there are people alive today because of you. Some some cases go good, some cases go bad. I, I've been there with you, brother. But don't don't lose that the meaning of the word hero because it means a lot to other people and the people that you have saved. Remember that. I will not argue that for you. I will not. I have a hard theory on hero. Hero is a word that people use when they can't comprehend something. Agreed. And I get that. But we, we are, we, to us, we aren't heroes because it's not, it's something we can comprehend. So I did, I do have a hard time with the word hero, but I am going to take what you say and I'm going to carry it with me because it is a, it is a word that I need to learn to accept. And I may not be able to accept it today, but I will be willing to accept it at some point because I have to. Because we did. We do good stuff. We do. Whether it's saving a cat or saving a person or stopping somebody from driving when they shouldn't. Yeah. You're right. We are, we, we are all heroes in some way and we, we need to acknowledge it. So thank you. I appreciate that. My pleasure, man. I love you, brother. You too, man. <laughs> Gabe, this has been an absolute pleasure. I cannot thank you enough for coming on, sharing the stories, the laughs, the good times, the bad times. Man, <laughs> this has been this has been just incredible for me. Thank you so much. If so, anybody ever wants to go out there and put out some of the funny stuff that's happened, man, I'm game. I'm all willing to do that kind of stuff. So we <laughs> see some you know, crazy things out there, man. <laughs> absolutely. You know, there was a little rumor uh, back in the day that you were a bit of a jokester too, maybe a prankster in the in the shop. I, I might throw that out there as well. I, 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 I've, I've had some, um, some moments. I mean, I don't know. Are we allowed to say anything on the, on the, on this? We can either confirm or deny that any of those pranks actually happen. <laughs> I, 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 one day we landed in Humboldt and it was a late night. Cause we actually had to bring back one of their swimmers and I landed and I asked the, um, the watch cat, I'm like, Hey, I need to get to the swimmer shop. And I went in and I took a picture of my ball sack on everybody's lock. And over the few months, I sent the photo to them saying, where have your hands been? <laughs> oh, my God. So that's that brilliant. All, so, you know, you got there's, there's, you to you enjoy the, the small things in life because we deal with some heavy shit. We got to find a way to enjoy it, you know? <laughs> that's so. brilliant. You, you may <laughs> have just given a lot of ideas to a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, I do not do that. I also got in trouble by the company Red Bull. So, like I said, the guy, we're filming with these guys Red Bull for like, for like a long ass time. And they're in Astoria. And there's a spot on a weekend that we'd go up and get milkshakes. And we were filming the landscapers are going, and he, they flew on every flight in case we had a rescue. And we decided to get milkshakes that one day. And he's like, hey, man, I want to get out with the flight mech and go grab the shakes. I want to see what you guys do. So they get out. They go get the shakes and I'm flying up and I'm in the back flying in the pattern waiting for them. And I look over at his camera and I'm like, I think I'm going to spend about three minutes filming my, my ball sack for him. That way when he goes back, he can turn on his video and he'll be seeing landscape and then see my balls, right? I thought this would be a good idea. I really did. Oh my God, so then dude. like three months go by and I get called to the engineering officer, uh, engineering officer's office. And they're like, hey, Gabe, would you need to come in here? So we're, we're sitting in this office, right? And they're, I'm on the phone, speaker phone, with the main company of Discovery Channel called Red Bull. And the lady's like, hey, Gabe, you remember me? I'm like, yeah. And she goes, I want to let you know that the cameramen don't review the footage before they send it to us. So we were watching this really cool footage. And the next thing you know, we're all trying to figure out what we're seeing. And we realize, I go, oh, shit. I'm like, oh, God. And like, man, I'm just standing there now, like, flushed. And she goes, it took us a few minutes to figure out what we're looking at. I mean, you must be sore because that was pretty like, you're like squeezing. <laughs> and she goes, it was literally like scenery, 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 balls for like three minutes. She goes, how did you do that for three minutes first off? <laughs> and I remember when they got off the phone, I'm just standing in front of the EO. And I'm like, fuck, I'm getting booked. And he just goes, I really don't know what to say. I've never even heard of this. He goes, just get the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> that was it. It was just like left. And I remember just going, oh my God, that was that was a good moment. So yeah, oh don't God, do that babe. stuff. Okay, because you will not get away with it this day and age. And there's some things that I didn't get away with. Andy didn't get in trouble for trying to be funny. 
So, uh, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Dude, way to end this on a freaking great note, dude. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Brother, I will be in touch with you uh, when I get down to Florida. We're kicking back some brews. We'll sit down together and just and tell more stories. I, I'm so looking Beautiful. forward to it. Dude, thank you so much. All right. I will see you soon. Thank you, Jason. All right. Anytime. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Go. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page, at therealrescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember, when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard. <laughs>